the webinar Sorting Truth from Fiction with Social Media Tools, which is presented as part of the Age of Disinformation Project. My name is Penny Caldwell. Before we begin, I'll just go over the format of our next hour together. The presentation will be about 45 minutes long and includes a 10-minute video partway through. 10 to 15 minutes before 3 o'clock, we'll stop and our panelists will take your questions. You can type them in on a Q&A panel that you'll see at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. When we get to that point, we'll uh, give you a reminder. Today, we're talking about BotSlayer, an application that helps track and detect potential manipulation of information spreading on Twitter. It's a new tool that combats the spread of false information, disinformation, and lies on social media by scanning in real time to detect evidence of automated Twitter accounts, also known as bots. The tool is developed by the Observatory on Social Media at Indiana University, the same lab that brought us bot Omitter and Hoaxy. It's a great example of science and journalism working together. And we're delighted to have three experts from Indiana University here today to tell us about BotSlayer. Val Pechev is the Associate Director and a Director of Information Technology at the Indiana University Network Science Institute. Pick Mai Hui is in the Informatics PhD program in the School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering at Indiana U. And Mark McCarty is an Associate Full Stack Developer at the Network Science Institute. Hello to all three of you. And uh, we can Hello. get started when you're ready. Hello, my name is Valentin Penchev. I'm the IT director of the Network Science Institute here at Indiana University. I want to thank everybody for joining in and welcome you to the workshop. I will start with a quick introduction of the project and then we'll pass it to Pikmai and Mark who will be able to show you a little bit more about it. First, I want to emphasize that we are not presenting our own work. This is a collaborative project between the Center for Complex Network and Systems Research and the Indiana University Network Science Institute. It's led by Professor Filippo Menster, you can see in the left top corner in his lab, and everyone else contributing to the project is uh, on this slide here, including Pick Mike himself, who will take the mic from me in a minute. I also want to spend a few minutes talking about the uh, IUNI, what we call the IU Network Science Institute. It is a very interesting startup into the heart of an established educational institution at the Indiana University. It is a cross-campus transdisciplinary institute that brings together faculty to engage in network research from various scientific fields. And the Observatory on Social Media is one of the projects of which Indiana University is behind. We are formed intentionally outside of any school. We don't have a dean to report to. We are not an educational institution. We do not have students and we do not issue degrees. We are directly reporting to the Vice Provost of Research here at Indiana University and we try to support any project on campus that has uh, the ability to advance the science of network research or network science. You see our mission in the middle of the screen. I will not read the complicated text, but what you are about to see, the tools of the observatory and social media are a perfect example of collaborative and interdisciplinary in research that advances the global use of network science. The IUNI team consists of a small administration, uh, the IT professionals you see at the bottom of the screen, I'm the one on the left, these are the people that I manage and the ones responsible for most of the back end and front end of the observatory of social media. But we also have a team of research scientists who engage with the researchers themselves, with people like Pikmai Hui, who is a doctoral student in the uh, Center for Complex and Network Research to really bring those projects to completion. I will turn it over to Pikmai himself, who will tell you a little bit more about the observatory and its tools. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'll take from here. I'm Pikmai. Hello, everybody. So before I start, this is actually the first slide that I'll be starting from. Before I start, I've heard that the audience are 
basically journal journalist um, publisher and I'm also happy that there are some students who are attending this webinar. Um, so I would like to keep this presentation pragmatic. Before I start, I would like to ask you a question. And please keep this question in mind as you go through the presentation, as I go through the presentation with you. And this question is, what kind of topic are you interested in? I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. What kind of stuff that happens in the last week or the last month that you're interested in that you would like to know more about? Okay, um, and now you go to, for example, Twitter and you search about that topic. You'll find a list of tweets and then from that list of tweets, you'll probably find some hashtag that are very frequent. Keep that hashtag in mind, and as we go through our examples and tools, try to think about what if your hashtag is in the place of the hashtag that we are using in our examples. All right, with that, let's get started. So we are, we are a research lab, we are doing research, and the first kind of question that we have been tackling for years is how do you distinguish misinformation from reliable information. From data, they are very hard to tell apart. And, um, and yeah. This is an example of a piece of misinformation that's traveling on Twitter. It is about a member in Clinton's campaign that <clears throat> apparently, according to that piece of information, is practicing spirit cooking. So we, as we read this piece of information, we kind of can tell that it is misinformation, but from the data itself, it's really hard to tell. Through our research, we have been asking using data, how do, how do online social network foster manipulation and misinformation spreading? As an example that I've just given you, that's just one instance. There are many, many more instances out there that's to be analyzed and discussed. Through all these years of research, we realized that we have been kind of repeating steps. So we collect data and then we analyze it in certain ways. We visualize them in certain ways. And these ways, we would like to provide the tools that we have built over the years to the public so that they can do the same thing that we have been doing through our research. And through these years, we have curated this set of tools and called that set of tools awesome. You can go to our website, um, which will give you the set of tools and the explanation. I probably will not take into details here. Um, there are more examples backward, but I would like to um, say that all these tools are free to everybody and they are web tools that are easy to use. So it doesn't require any technical knowledge and you can just go and play with them. So what kind of question would you ask if you have a hashtag in mind that you are interested, um, a topic in mind? Well, what are people tweeting about over the time in each location. Let's say that um, I'm interested in snow, the hashtag, at a specific day. The snow hashtag is tweeted at specific location. This map visualizes how many tweets at each location on January 22nd that has the hashtag snow on it. And you can see that the, the east coast has more snow and the West Coast on that specific day. Now this example is kind of lame, you may think, but let's think about how to apply this example in the topic of interest that you have. For example, you may think about a specific hashtag that a campaign is using um, versus the anti-campaign. Maybe the campaign is around vaccine, so you would think about a hashtag that's about pro-vaccine group and a hashtag that the anti-vaccine group is using. And over time, you can visualize how these groups are spread in different regions.
The another kind of question that you can ask about a specific topic is how they trained over time overall. Um, right here, we have the Super Bowl and the World Series of Baseball. If you think about it, they are really kind of competing for audience. So they, over time, will, ex will show an anti-correlation. One rise up and the another goes down. Versus if you think about something that's really correlated intrinsically, like here we have the hashtag TBF, which stands for Throwback Friday to celebrate the weekend coming, and also the hashtag weekend. They are kind of related to the same sentiment that that's enjoying the weekend incoming, and therefore they should be correlated over time, and we do see that they are correlated over time. The example that we are, again, we're giving here are kind of trivial, but let's think about how to use this tool to do more engaging research. If you have two hashtags that you are not quite sure if they are anti-correlated and correlated, for example, you suspect that certain hashtag is being adopted by a campaign, but you are not quite sure. So you, what you would do is you pick a hashtag that you know it's associated with that campaign, and the hashtag that you suspect will be associated with that campaign, and you use this tool to see if they are being more correlated over time. That's one way to use it. And also the network tool will allow you to visualize around that topic within a certain period of time who interacted with who, who retweeted who, and who mentioned who. Now with all this tool, it's all great. If you try to do the data analysis, collect the data, and visualize it, you may end up getting some kind of network of users interaction that looks like this. Um, this network shows the interaction of users on Twitter around the hashtag SB2277, which is a bill that, that's um, uh, trying to get passed in California for vaccine policy. I will not go into the detail of this um, context, but uh, the visualization here is basically the discourse around this topic. Um, and with this, you may want to ask, OK, where are the manipulation? Where are the misinformation? If you think about misinformation, a lot of them are being driven by um, ways that are semi-automated, what we call bots account. Now, you probably can't go through all of those accounts on our network with your own eyes. So eyeballing all accounts are probably not feasible if you have a large data set. So we, as researchers, have developed a machine learning tool to help us distinguish accounts that are more likely to be bots versus accounts that are more likely to be human. This tool is called Botometer, and it's also available as one of the tools in uh, OSM. You can, right now, it's live, it's free. Then you can go to the website and check with the user handle of any account how likely they are bought. This tool is prob probabilistic. So what does it mean? It means that you probably have an account that are very, very likely to be human. It's just human, basically. And you have some account that you know very, very likely to be a bot. And you have some account that are in the middle, some that looks more like bots, and some that looks more like human, and some looks like a mix. Our tool will provide a probabilistic estimation of how likely that account is a bot. So here we have an account that's our developer of this tool, Botometer, who is Honor, and the Justin Bieber photo, which is just a automated account to distribute Justin Bieber's photo. So you can see that for our developer's <coughs> account, it's, it has a very low percentage versus the Justin Bieber account that has a very high percentage. And you would also have some account that are in between. Based on the number that we present to you, you will be able to interpret how likely this account being a bot. 
So using that tool with the data set that you have, the visualization that you have, you'll be able to color this graph with how likely each node, each user account is a bot. So here we have colored the nodes based on um, how likely they are bots, red being very likely and blue being very unlikely, so they are human, blue being likely to be human and red being likely to be bots. Um, you can also see from this network that there is a one small group that are pro-vaccine and a large group that are anti-vaccine and most, most actually bots happens in both but the most influencing ones are happening in the anti-vaccine ones. Of course it's not just bounded, this, this kind of techniques are not just bounded to a certain topic, you can also do it in other topics. Here we have another visualization that's for Brexit and you can think of replacing this visualization with, a, with the hashtag that I just informed you to think about, the hashtag that you are interested in. You, you would say that, okay, these are all well, these are all good. How should I generate such a graph that looks like the graph that you just presented to me? Well, we also have a tool for you to do exactly that. That's called Hoxie. That's also part of the awesome toolkit. And it will generate a network if you give a query about a certain topic. It can be hashtag, it can be just a query. Um, when you query this system, it has two tabs. One tab is Twitter, which I just attempted to circle. Uh, I don't think it's working, but uh, you see the highlighted tab that, that's hoaxy and on the left is a small tab that's Twitter. If you click Twitter and um, search on that, it will pull the live tweets that are that are um, from I think past week past two weeks past day okay so um, past day um, that are about that topic versus if you click the hoaxy tab and um, search about your query you will get our tracking database data that's about article surrounding that topic. Um, you can see that in the network visualization here, the nodes are actually colored based on how likely they are a bot and how likely they are a human. And you can also click on the nodes and see what they are tweeting about, who they are interacting with. And I would also say that if you click the play button, in the middle, it will play exactly, it will play out over time exactly how the information is spreading in this network. So what, how, how you can use this tool as a journalist, for example? Well, once you have this network, you can dig down into the, for example, the denser region of the network visualization that you have to zoom in, and then you look at the more important nodes that are bigger, they have more they have more interaction. And look at who they are, what they are doing, what they are tweeting about. In this example that we are showing here, it is a very dense region of a visualization of um, uh, accounts that are tweeting misinformation versus accounts that are giving out fact-checking information. So Politic Facts and Snopes are both fact-checking websites versus Real Alex Jones and Prison Planet, which are um, not, not that reliable sources. Um, so the way that they reference, you would be interested in why would they ever mention fact-checking website? Would that be smacking their own face? Um, so the way that they use fact-checking website is to use it completely out of context, for example, um, that they say one thing and then cite some PolitiFact URL, PolitiFact link, and actually the, the content of the link says a completely, draws a completely opposite con conclusion from what they are saying. Um, so here we have 13 hours of hell in blah blah blah, her email shows that she knew about the truth, while in the PolitiFact 
link that's being referenced, it's actually saying that she, which is Clinton, didn't know about it, didn't know about the email. Um, so it's completely opposite of what they're drawing in the conclusion. Oh, sorry. Um, and actually, if you look at the denser region, you'll probably see more bots. Now, all of these tools are kind of the steps that we have been going through in order to get to the, the final steps that we're here aggregating everything, right? Every tool that has been presented is kind of like a small step that you can do certain aspect of the, of the analysis. And first layer, which we'll be going into is also the main topic of today's presentation, is an aggregation of the awesome tool, um, really, that allows you to do many things at once. Um, so all of this started with last year, United States midterm election, that we realized that our tool is collecting data, but it is not really actively pushing out information. So we, have, we know that what we're looking for, we go retrospectively using our tool to look at and analyze the data. What if we have a more active way to collect data and analyze them in real time, show the results, pushing out the results to the general public? So we developed such a tool, which is called Bot Electioneering Volume for last year's midterm election. This is basically the first previous version of Bot Slayer. Um, as you can see, it gives you a daily estimation of how many bots are engaging in the discussion around the election and what kind of topic they're talking about, what kind of hashtag they're talking about, what kind of user they're, they're mentioning, et cetera, et cetera. And this website is updating in real time every day. We realized that after de de developing this tool that we realized that being able to push out analysis in real time and collect our own data is really important for us and also for general public who would like to know more information about the topic that they are interested in. It may not be even necessarily about election. It can be about anything like vaccine, like trading, like any topic. So with that, we'll now introduce the next step, which is boss layer. Welcome to Bot Slayer, the tool that can help you track and detect potential manipulation of information spreading on Twitter. One of the best things about Bot Slayer is that it is relatively quick and easy to set up and use. So before we dive into the features, let me show you how to set up your very own instance. We'll be breaking this down into a few steps. First, we'll look at the instructions on the awesome tools page. Bot Slayer is located in the top right, so we'll click on that. On this page, there's an introduction to Bot Slayer, instructions on getting the software, instructions on multiple ways to install it, and legal information. We'll be clicking this form in order to fill out the Google form to receive a string of characters that we'll need later. I've already filled this one out, but you can see that it's a short form. Once you've read the EULA, filled out the form, and click Submit, the secret string will be given to you. We'll copy paste that and put it onto Notepad, but you can choose to remember it however you wish. Next, we'll go to AWS, which stands for Amazon Web Services. You can create a free account here so that you can set up a free server that will house BotSlayer. The setup process may ask for a credit card, but following our instructions and only using AWS's free tier, you will not incur any charges. Once you're logged in, you'll see the following screen. Your screen may look slightly different than mine, but we're looking for the All Services drop-down. Under the Compute section, we'll be selecting EC2. Then we'll click the blue Launch Instance button. There are a lot of options here, but we want to search that string we got earlier from the Google Form. Let's paste it into the search box and press Enter. Now we'll click the One Results in Community AMIs. We can see BS standing for Bot Slayer Beta 
Clicking the blue select button, we're taken to the instance setup wizard. This wizard should always auto select the t2.micro type, and you should see the free tier eligible green highlighted text. You can select a better machine, but you'll be charged for it. Press next configure instance details in the bottom right. We'll be stepping through most steps of the wizard here. This step can be skipped, so we're moving on to the next add storage. By default, the size and gigabytes tab should show 30. This is the maximum storage limit for the free tier. If you want more storage, it'll be charged to your AWS account. Assuming we want a free instance, we'll move on to next add tags. This is an optional step used for organization and searchability. We'll move on to next configure security group. Looking at the bots layer instructions, we'll need two custom security settings. First, we want to add an HTTP rule. No edits are necessary. Next, we want to add a custom TCP rule and edit the port range tab to 9001. Under the source tab, we want to copy the zeros from the HTTP row to the custom TCP row like this. Let's click the blue review and launch button in the bottom right. Double check that we're using t2.micro and that our storage size is 30 gigabytes. Now we can click the blue launch button. You want to create a new key pair here. Name it whatever you like and then click the gray download key pair. Store this in a safe location and then click the blue launch instances button. You can now click the I followed by a hyphen and a long string link. We're now looking at the information about our bot slayer instance. If the instance state is not a green circle with running yet, then we'll need to wait or refresh the page or the table with the refresh button near the top right. Now we can note the IP or highlight it and control C or command C copy it. The right click menu is contextual with AWS, so make sure to use the keyboard shortcut if you're going to copy paste. Open a new tab, enter the copied IP address, and we should see bot slayer. If not, it could take up to five minutes to load the software, so please be patient. We're very, very close to being able to use bots there. Our table of data isn't showing up because we need to set up a query. Let's move to the config page. Here we see the first time set up. You can set your bots there password to whatever you like, but you should keep it to yourself so no one can change your instance without permission. Now log in with the password you just set. Here we can enter the query and our Twitter keys denoted in the bottom four rows as key, secret, and token. We'll come back to how to search because for now we need to obtain those Twitter keys. Hovering the question mark, we see that we need to go to the help page for more information. We won't do that in this video, but note that the information is there if you ever need it in the future. Let's go to developer.twitter.com and complete the last setup steps. Create a new Twitter account just for this, or you can use your own. Move to the drop down in the top right area and select apps. Now let's create an app with the light blue button in the top right section. I've already filled this app out because I wanted to show you that it's not a very lengthy process. Press the light blue create button at the bottom of the page and note that Twitter may take a moment to approve your app, but it's usually not that long. Once the app is created, we can go back to the app page and click the white details button to move to its page. Now let's click the keys and tokens tab. Let's generate consumer API keys and access token and access token secret keys. We'll need all four of these, so copy paste them with the corresponding names of bots later, which should be in the same order. Enter each of the four keys and we can finally decide on what we'll search for. Maybe Justin Trudeau would be a good pick. Two of the three rows are extremely useful in that kind of query. Follow will allow us to see all replies, mentions, etc. of Justin Trudeau's Twitter account as long as we know his ID. But track is even easier to use and perhaps more useful and more powerful. It will find any co-occurring hashtags, users, words, phrases, links, etc. that are in a tweet with any of our search terms. So let's put in at Justin Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, his name, and maybe election and hashtag election. Now let's click the blue Save button and return to the data page. This is the familiar Bot Slayer home screen. You can see that the query we entered on the config page is here, so we don't need to move back and forth to double check what we're searching for. 
Botslayer doesn't take very long to start showing results, but let's look at my long running instance to see some more of the functionality and get a sneak peek at the next beta release. As you can see, I'm tracking Bitcoin. By default, Botslayer will sort by the highest BS level, but you're free to toggle other sorts and filters to see the exact data that you want. Maybe you're only interested in links shared in posts that contain your query, so you toggle the links filter. Specifically, you're interested in shortened links, so you type bit.ly in the filter box. Next, you want the most tweeted, so you sort by tweets. Like this, you can likely find exactly what you're looking for. Untoggling links and removing the filter for bit.ly, we see the highest tweet counts overall. All extracted text that isn't a typical entity will show in bold like that. Going along the top row, we can click the exclude button to show a thousand rows that don't include the query itself. This can be useful if you have a query with many terms because you may want to see what's related to them, not just them themselves. The date time box and the time warp button allow you to see data older than four hours since bots there only shows data in relation to the most recent four hours. Refresh does exactly what it sounds like, but the table will auto refresh every five minutes anyway. You can click export to export a CSV that contains data equivalent to your bot slayer table. Finally, the hoaxy and research tabs. We find that these are useful for getting more info than what the table shows on its own. You can click the bot icon to send your collected data to hoaxy to visualize the network. Let's try it. So this is our collected data from bot slayer visualized here on hoaxy. Let's say we didn't collect a lot of data on this entity because it was restricted to tweets with only Bitcoin. We can leverage Twitter directly with Hoaxy to see what everyone's saying about it. So let's go back to Botslayer and click the heart icon to search Hoaxy live. Sometimes there will be a very different graph and it can be interesting to compare for sure. We also have what we call a timeline, which shows the change over time for a particular entity. All of the other buttons search the particular medium for the entity to the left. Interestingly, if there's an image or video embedded in the tweet, Google will take the image or video thumbnail and reverse image search it for you. We hope you've enjoyed this Botslayer introduction and tutorial. Thank you. Thank you all. You were hearing the voice of Mark McCarty, our main Hoaxy and Awesome Tools developer, and I will pass the mic to him now to walk you through a few use case scenarios as well. Hey guys, this is Mark McCarty. It's good to meet you. Um, I hope that video illuminated a little bit of how simple it can be to set up Botslayer. Um, if there was anything you're intimidated by, we have instructions on our website, and um, be assured that you know we'll answer questions you know within the next weekday usually. So. If you have any interesting questions about bots there, how to use it, just let us know. Okay, so what we're looking at here are some use cases, um, just to have something different than the one that was in the video. For instance, we searched hashtag cat um, and let it collect data for a little while. Um, if you look at the top right where it says botness on the table, um, there's you know a pretty medium or medium high bot score on this one, which at least somewhat directly correlates to the BS level, which stands for bot slayer level. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily have to work that way though. For instance, the hashtag cats of Twitter one between the Japanese text down there um, in the middle um, has a slightly higher bot score, but a lower BS level because you know maybe it hasn't reached as many people or it's not trending as much. Um, so this is a relatively benign example, but we just want you to get an idea of like the different kinds of things you can look up with Botslayer. So for instance, with that cats of Twitter, we could see why does it have the bot score level that it has. We click on the heart icon and we're giving the hoaxy visualization. If we look around, most of them seem relatively benign. There's a blue circle at the bottom in the middle and some greenish stuff in the middle as well. But up in the top corner, or top middle rather, there's this red circle where there's likely a lot of bot activity. 
we've zoomed into it and we can see there are a lot of thought activity going on here and it seems like maybe they're even targeting this yellow account in the middle. If we click on that account, we can see that actually they were retweeted by a bunch of bots. So maybe something that they said was something that bots wanted to share for whatever reason or another. And this timeline shows the correlation between accounts, tweets, trendiness, and botness, and it can sort of give you an idea of where the BS level comes from. Um, you can see in the trendiness in the bottom that at 10, it spiked in popularity, so there are more accounts tweeting about it, more tweets in general, and the bot score, the bot uh, level also increased right around 10. Now we can also look at other social media platforms, like we can dive into Twitter just to see maybe what they were talking about. We could search it on Google. We could go to 4chan, although I don't recommend you look at that at work. Um, we can go to Facebook, see if there's any Facebook groups related to it, um, YouTube for videos, and Reddit even. So here on Reddit, we see that the hashtag cats of Twitter is being used in you know, quite a few Reddit posts. So um, it gives you an idea of what's going on. In this case, on the Reddit, subreddit uh, news, news bot bot, there's the exact um, statuses we were seeing there on um, bot slayer. So here's a maybe more useful, uh, but still relatively benign use case. Um, here's Bitcoin, kind of like what was going on in my video. Um, you can see that there's a lot more bot-related activity. Um, for instance, this Japanese one on the third says present. So you know it's like some kind of campaign to get free Bitcoins or something like that. Um, the, the one at the top is success trading. One account tweeted 99 times. Um, it had a very high bot score, and that does kind of seem bot-like, doesn't it? So here, this is a different visualization from a different bot slayer um, instance we were looking at. We were looking at, um, at, at uh, Donald Trump-related things and Russia and that kind of thing, and we saw uh, Bill Browder was targeted. He was he's someone related to Trump's campaign, basically, and you can see that there are a lot of bots in this top left area, a lot of these red circles that are talking about him, trying to spread misinformation one way or the other. And so um, basically, to round it up, Thoughtslayer can collect data 24 seven um, and be always up to date because it shows users what's suspicious in real time. Um, it, it has a chance for you to look back by using the time machine feature. Um, so, you, so even though bots there is usually just showing the four hours of the latest data, you can look back in time and see maybe something you might have missed. Um, and there's lots of different ways to research the data once it's presented to you. And so we plan to um, update it all the time. Like the beta you saw was something that some features that were only just recently um, added. So you, you might be seeing those in, over the next month or so. Well, thank you, Mark and Big Mike, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think this is all we have to share with you today, and I would like to open the, the floor for questions. Wonderful. So we've got the Q&A manager up there, and uh, you should be able to see it in the bottom left side of your screen. And uh, if you have questions, you can type them in, and then we'll uh, pose the questions to Val, pick my and Mark uh, for them well, to answer. And thank you, guys. That was a really uh, interesting presentation. Um, for some of us, it might seem uh, complicated to register, but it it does show that it's a fairly uh, straightforward process to do that. And uh, can you see journalists starting to use uh, a platform like this uh, to do real-time uh, research into topics they're interested in? Yes, absolutely. And while we are waiting for questions, since for what I see we explained everything so great, 
there are no questions at all. Uh, I want to make a few clarifications. Uh, bot, Botslayer is the only tool that requires <laughs> installation on its own. Uh, and it's meant for a little bit more sophisticated audience. And yes, uh, every journalist should be able to start an instance on their own, uh, as should be able to do institutions and larger organizations. But I want to go back to the rest of the awesome tools. Uh, there were a few under a line there which are the awesome friends. Those are tools developed by other people who utilize our APIs and data on the back end. And everything we develop is uh, open source, open code, and free, with the slight exception of Botometer, which we do not open, especially not to aid the bot developers in their work. Uh, we're also very proud that the tools are available from our website with just a click. We intentionally do not uh, ask you to register or to provide a username or a password or anything in that regard. And we very proudly do not even keep IP addresses and purge all the logs whenever possible. So the tools are available for everyone to use again with the slight exception of uh, bots there which we just represented that people would need to register just because we do not want to have this image that was obscured in the video available to the entire world without our permission. Great. Um, how long have you been working on this, uh, Val? When did it actually start development? Well, I believe the development started in 2007. The, the observatory was started by a National Science Foundation grant, I believe, in 2010 or slightly before that. Uh, most of those tools that you saw rely on a 10% of Twitter data being collected since 2010. I myself and the uh, IO Network Science Institute uh, started in 2015 when the institute was established. But the data has been collected for at least four or five years before that already. Interesting. And uh, where do you see the evolution going from here? Well, in my mind, most of those tools help people make up their mind of how trustworthy particular news information is. You can see there are no distinctions. We do not claim this one is a bot, this one isn't, this one is misinformation, this one is not. But by showing you the network and the probabilistics in it, uh, we hope that one can make their own judgment because they do vary from case to case. Where I see this going, I would like to see most of those tools integrated in other systems, in newsrooms, in uh, most of the social media, so people know uh, and can make their mind about what they're currently reading. Most of our research shows that people who spread misinformation in social media don't really want to do that. They're doing it because they do not have time to check their sources, they are not sure what they're sharing, or it's just funny. you see it becoming automated or do you think a user will always have to check the check the source themselves it will be very it will be very hard to establish exactly what is correct and what is incorrect or misinformation um, because the notion of being correct is kind of uh, human created um, so Sometimes um, there are statements that are so vague that you just can't assert that it's correct. Some sources has a mix of misinformation and reliable information, so you can't go by sources either. Um, so overall, it's a very difficult pro um, question that we're trying to tackle to tell whether a piece of information is misinformation or not. And the approach of boss layer, the approach that boss layer is taking is to show the user the users, how the spreader is interacting with each other, how the consumer of the information are interacting with each other, and whether each individual account is behaving like an automated account. Through that, the user himself, herself, 
can decide whether that piece of information being shared is a piece of misinformation. Yeah, I'm also very weary of having uh, AI, artificial intelligence, make decisions of any kind. Anyone who's applied for a credit card knows how this process works. Uh, but it can really aid in finding the needles in the haystack and showing it to people so they can make their own judgment. Uh, you saw how the networks look like, and this presents a lot of visual cues that are not there in just a tabular format of hundreds of thousands of tweets. But making the artificial intelligence evaluate those fully, uh, I don't think we, the humanity, is not there yet. If you think of statements of, uh, I am the best, I am the strongest, I am the most beautiful, uh, are those fake news? I know you can't see me, but uh, are those fake news or is this real information? Interesting. Um, what else are you working on that uh, that our audience might find interesting that's sort of related to the bot slayer and other platforms you've been developing? So uh, I'll, it's kind of not, a, not a additional work on it, but we have been thinking about um, how would people use bot slayer and when they use bot slayer, what kind of things they would do. Um, for example, if you use boss layer to track an, a topic of your interest and you find all these bots, right, or you find a topic that's being targeted by bots, since boss layer is a tool that will collect data for you and actively report things, um, before you start boss layer, you actually have no data about it, which is why the awesome toolkits overall are helpful because when you see something suspicious like um, uh, somebody is attacking the browser, then you can look at when that started to happen, even though you have absolutely no data with other tools that we have on the platform. So the tool, the boss layer tool, is a software that runs on your own machine, whereas the other awesome tool that we provide on the platform also provide data that's we, that we are sharing. Yeah, also, where this is all going, uh, we mentioned that we've been collecting data since 2010 and we've been developing all those tools, part of the observatory and social media. Uh, we're actually starting a new institute for it. We were awarded uh, a significant amount by the Knight Foundation, shared with the Indiana uh, University itself, of creation of new center to study information and the diffusion of information on social media. This is also between CNET and IUNI, but we have the media school involved uh, with the idea of first expanding on the observatory and social media in, the, in a cloud platform, second bringing more uh, data sources like YouTube conspiracy theories, uh, 4chan, Reddit data, and so on, and being able to expand those tools to become really more uh, cross-platform detection tools. And this media school is actually starting a new master's program in data journalism. So the idea of all of this is to be able to present the public and the journalists in, in, in general with the information and tools they need to be able to distinguish what the information is in social media. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um. It's interesting to see these things uh, being uh, developed in response to social pressure, you know, to try and find where there are instances of disinformation or misinformation, and then um, magnification of that or amplification of that. Well, I don't think we have any more questions at this end. Was there anything that uh, you'd like to add? before we wrap up our session today? Go test our tools, take a look, write back to us. Uh, again, we're just starting <laughs> a very big effort of transferring all this into a larger platform. And 
Uh, I manage the uh, IT team, as I mentioned. A lot of times the IT folks are accused of building systems they like and inviting people to use them. We try to take the opposite approach and have conversation with the users as much as we can before we start building the tools. Mm -hmm. And as people um, use your tools, you're getting uh, gathering that feedback to improve the tool. Absolutely. So. Uh, again, my, my closing words, go use our tools, use the platform, see what you like, see what, what you don't like, and let us know. So the next version can be better. Okay. I have something to add on top of that. So oh. I, I know the audience are yeah. in the publishing, in the publisher industry. So let's let's think about this situation. Let's say suddenly tomorrow, White House is attacked by somebody. This actually happened as a piece of misinformation some years ago and it crashed the market, the, the, the trader market, the trading market, stock market, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. So if you don't collect data today, when the events happen tomorrow, when White House is attacked, you have no data and you don't know it's happened until somebody tells you that it happened. Or in this case, Parliament, right? Uh, well, <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, if you use Sports Layer and your interest, your topic of interest is Paramount, for example, then if anything happens around Paramount, you will be able to get first-hand data and visualization and analysis about whether that piece of information is likely to be fake or not. In my previous example, when this White House being bombed, information comes out, came out. Um, it actually crashed the market and it was fake. Imagine if Boss Layer was a tool that's already out there at that time, then it probably would save the market. Yeah, and then if I could just add, um, like it could be used in very similar ways, um, you know. How do I do this? It can be used in similar ways, like politically, of course. So, I mean, one of the test instances we use, um, I often track MAGA, like Make America Great Again, Donald Trump, to see what, you know, what kind of information they're trying to spread or or are being targeted by. Um, and sometimes things really surprise you, or you learn something new. Like I learned um, that on Twitter. There's these things called trains where people just follow everybody on a list of users and they prepare this for when the big information or misinformation depending uh, campaign is ready to start so that they can reach a larger number of users um, and all be interconnected. And so, you know, maybe, maybe you follow Justin Trudeau and before you know it, you, you see maybe people talking about the blackface thing on Twitter before it reaches the mainstream media or something, and then all of a sudden now you're able to um, either be the first to the scoop kind of thing, or also you know find out some things that maybe don't get reported on as much. So, interesting. And I if you think you. what we do is easy, I want to leave you with uh, the last tool we have, which is a game we've developed called Fakey. It can be played on a PC or a mobile device, and it presents you with a feed very similar to the one you would see on Facebook or Twitter, and making you make decisions of should you share this or should you fact check it. Uh, go take a look. It is surprisingly hard to distinguish fake news from real. And we'll present this to you as a challenge. That we think that you probably cannot tell that this information are right in front of you, but you will just click share. How do people uh, get in touch with you if they wanted to follow up? Is that possible? Yeah, sure. I think most of the information is on the observatory and social media. Uh, the site is awesome, O-S-O-M-E. 
dot iuni dot io dot edu. I think we have it here. Does it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if we can go to one of the early slides, can I jump slides here? Or no? Oh yes. Okay. okay. Uh, um, no, it's a little bit down. It's probably seven. Okay, here. Yep. So this is the actual site of the observatory on social media, awesome.iuni.edu. And there under about and contact us is all the information how we can be reached. You can also see all the, uh, the publications we have there. You can see what the press has to say about us. And you can see a few more recorded videos about each individual tool and general trending as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Val and Pikmai and Mark, for sharing your time and your presentation, your awesome tools. Um, uh, it's been a really fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, webinar on um, what you're developing there. And I'm going to be following it with great interest. Thank you. And by the way, oops, sorry. Our next, uh... oh, go ahead. No, no, that's it. Thank you very much. OK. Um, I just wanted to let people know uh, before we end our hour today that our next Magazines Canada webinar is on Wednesday, November 20th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, results of the federal election on Monday are top of mind for all of us in the magazine industry. And in this uh, one hour webinar, Shirley Angel, Public Affairs Counselor for Compass Rose Group and a former journalist, uh, national broadcast journalist, and Melanie Rutledge, our Executive Director of Magazines Canada, uh, will be discussing the outcomes, including the opportunities and risks facing the magazine sector and what we can look forward to next with the federal government. So. You can register now at magazinescanada.ca under the Professional Development tab to hear what the results of the 2019 election mean for you and your magazine. Thanks again to um, our representatives, uh, Val, Pikmai, and Mark, for your great presentation today. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.